Welcome back to a very British space program. This is episode 13. Last time we went into space, we put some satellites up there. We made the world aware. It is currently the 10th of June, 1957. And we've got reports that the USSR and the USA, they're, they're sort of scrambling for launches because they've realized that um, the British might actually be up there already. So uh, we better keep going. So, um, in this episode, we're actually going to send up a magnetic scanner on our final flight of the Red Princess 4A before we upgrade it, and we're going to try and get it to sun-synchronous orbit. But for, before that, though, uh, the plane division are going to try and go up, up and away to uh, a new target of 110 kilometers, going faster and higher, and we have Carol Freeman in the seat um, flying the White Javelin 1B. So um, following this flight, we're going to look to upgrade the engines to, to add a little bit more thrust and efficiency to this craft, I think, because we're currently running, uh, I think, the first generation Spectre engines. And they're not the greatest, but they, they do have a nice burn time on them. Give us a nice bit of thrust and, and the craft as well. So you see, we fly up there and uh, we achieve the target pretty easily, actually. Carol is happy. She was she's calm, actually. I want to say she's happy. And I do think this is a, it's a lovely looking little craft here. It's... Uh, it's, it's quite it's quite attractive it, it looks I, th I prefer it to the to the old white arrow 2b um, I think it's got a lot more potential long term in it but we may have to modify it quite a bit so anyway we uh, we come back through and we're we're trying to we're, I was trying to test the uh, the re-entry sort of slope on it we we're trying to keep a high angle of attack as we came in and I'm using um, atmospheric autopilot quite a bit at the moment for this craft and I think that transition when it's actually coming into the atmosphere is a bit of a problem for atmospheric autopilot it doesn't really like it um, so I'm probably going to end up trying using standard SAS and switching between the two to see what happens but you know we recovered well enough the nose took a bit of a dive but again we're coming through the atmosphere and through the clouds you can barely see what's going on this option into the ground too hard um, and we're on a nice sort of uh, glide path here um, it's pretty easy in fact uh, so we come in we, uh, we stick the uh, the the, uh, the wheels down and it's a nice simple landing we've done this so many times so many craft just onto the little the, the flat bed of australia couldn't be a problem whatsoever um just glide it down take all the energy out right at hundreds we're under 170 meters per second this is a slow landing for us compared to past flights 140 down air brakes on perfectly easy whoop what the, yeah yeah that's right we hit something and oh dear oh 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 carol carol well that is miraculous carol has survived um not much of the craft has survived but but carol has survived so um she's done it again another i suppose any 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 landing you can walk away from anyway while we figure out what's going on there, we're also going to do an X-Plane supersonic contract, and that's going to be a nice easy one. It's uh, the 15th of July, and it's just going to be a quick flight from the white signal because it's not a particularly uh, difficult flight, this one. Um, this is going to be Kim Jarvis over in the UK taking off from uh, Spade Adam, and uh, all she's got to do is get over 400 meters per second. And, uh, you know, this craft is more than capable of this. It's still using its, its first generation Avon engines mark 101 um, so they've got about half the half the thrust of what you would find on the later versions if you play an RP1 um, these these engines the the mark 101 were actually developed in I think 1951 1952 by um, by Rolls-Royce and um, so they're actually quite old tech already because we're, we're we're well on we're in 1957 already so they're behind the times um, I think we have actually got access to the to some of the, the operated ones now, but I just haven't upgraded this craft yet, so I need to I need to get on with that and do that. I think. Um, so she's flying, she's flying well. She's, it's a nice, easy one. She she breaks the speed limit and everything. Turns around, which is you can see this craft's really nicely manoeuvrable. It's a lot bigger than uh, than our other craft. Although saying that, the uh, the white javelin is now actually starting to get closer to this sort of size. It, it, it's it's sort of halfway between the original white arrow two a two b and this. So we've got some nice size craft developing, um, and uh, and we've got a success. It's a it's it's a wonderful little uh, mission, and we're very happy with it. 
um, which is great. And the landing, uh, we, we can get a little bit of worry about the landing because we've we just had a bad one. Um, so this is really important that Kim nails this because uh, we've already got some bad press from the, shall we say, constructive, deconstructive reassembly of of the uh, the white javelin B, one B, and uh, yeah, she puts it down beautifully near uh, near the the runway, and we're fine. So. Now we're going to get back to that sun synchronous orbit satellite. So this is uh, an excuse for me to actually uh, to get some more science, more than anything else. So we're going to put this into sun synchronous orbit. We're launching again with our final. This will be the final Red Maiden 4A because we're actually going to operate the engines on it. It's going to get operated and become the, uh, the Red Maiden 4B because we've now got some slightly better Spectre engines to, to attach to it. So that should actually give us a, a better payload for this. It can at the moment put pretty much the satellites we want into uh, near Earth orbit. But yeah, it's uh, it's not doing too bad. So um, this is the 19th of August in 1957. Um, we're aiming to put it into sun synchronous orbit. So we want to periaps over 300 kilometers um, with a, a 95 to 99 degree inclination. Um, so we've actually got to fly sort of back on this on the rotation of the earth we're going to cancel it out a bit um, and we want a, a reasonably low eccentricity um to to try and i think it's a 0 0.002 0 0.004 or something we, we, we're going for a, a low eccentricity on this and you can see the craft on the top there is very it's actually quite different to our previous our puck craft it is a small box and it, it is um yeah it's it's tiny um it's uh it's probably the smallest satellite that I will ever put up anywhere because it literally is just some batteries, some solar cells, and one piece of equipment, which is uh, the, the magnetospheric science equipment, and that's what we're looking for. Um, so this is going to be UK MRS-1A, or UK Magnetic Res Magneto Resonance Science Satellite Craft. I can't remember what I actually used the acronym for, but it's UK MIS-1A. And um, we're calling it the, the, the Sylph because it's another fairy because we're going with the fairy themes for a lot of our satellites. I'll probably run, I'll probably stop naming them in a while when it becomes sort of standard. You can see we have a, one engine out on this stage and this is another another engine out. If you go back in the previous episodes, we've had a few of these Spectre engines cut out. But luckily because of their high gimbal rate, uh, they can actually make up for it. Uh, so there we go. We're on to our final stage. This is the old Red Maiden, uh, ooh, what is it? Red Maiden 4B, 5C, something upper stage that basically has now morphed into this craft. Um, this again will be operated, so we're going to give it a bit more um, control, attitude control with thrusters and things, because we're going to get a lot more contracts that actually require um, more specific orbit positioning and things like that. And so we're going to we're going to actually sort of operate our our top stage just so it can do some orbital maneuvers, and we don't have to put too much onto our satellites because. Control cores are heavy, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to reduce the amount of stuff we're actually trying to send up. We don't want to duplicate things. And you see there, we're just spinning it around, um, keeping the uh, the ullage on the motor there. We're going to see what we can do. Da -da -da -da. Have we got into roughly the right position? And uh, we're then going to fire our, um, our RCS thrusters. There we go. Ullage and just pull ourselves in there. So we're actually going to use the, the RCS control there on the port just to put it into the right orbit. Um, and and there's, there's enough fuel on board to do that. Once you're in orbit of Earth, you know, moving and changing your orbits are a lot easier than getting up there, so that's good. Um, so fingers crossed um, that will that will go well, I'm hoping. Um, and you can see there, it's just gonna float around in space, nice and easy. And yeah, so this is, uh, this isn't bad. It's 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 made it up into orbit. It's got a bit of electricity. There is there was a bit of concern that actually I was concerned that its solar cells would actually not be able to provide enough electricity. And we're on a situation in a situation right now where the control cores on these things are, are not brilliant. They're actually very power hungry and they're very heavy. Um, so this thing, because of the way it's rotating, um, while it's doing science, it's running out of electricity. So we're probably going to find that it do the thing where it, it does a bit of science transmits it uses its electricity basically dies then it ends up in a, uh, a situation where it charges itself up until it gets enough electricity and it does that sort of horrible stuttering as it's trying to get science once the science is done and the experiments are finished 
it's science load it's it's electricity load should be fine and you know hopefully by then the degradation of solar panels is not going to be too much um now news just in however 4th of october 1957 the ussr has joined us in orbit yeah um while uh, while they're doing that though we're thinking about our next mission we're thinking about well it's about time we sent up some 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 satellites of different sorts we've got a few different uh, opportunities to go for so being british as we are we're going to send up a nice early weather satellite uh, this is going to be the uk news 1a and we're going to it uses what we're going to call the red bus uh, satellite bus which is going to be standard for a lot of these early early uh, satellite launches because we can put the payload into it and so here we are um, we are launching on the 21st of November 1957 so that's about a month and a half after Russia have actually gone into orbit um, and this is going to be our, our first weather satellite it's going to hopefully open up a range of uh, contracts for us to, for, for making a bit more money um, just a little note about the USSR they, they are claiming uh, triumph their, their, their broadcasters are, are talking about the wonderful beeps that they're sending around the uh, planet we we did point out that we'd, we'd sent you know video pictures back and temperature readings and things like that and we could actually take pictures of Moscow but uh, yeah the, the Russians have gone into full force pointing out how great they are um, so yeah we'll uh, we'll see what's going on there the concern that we do have is that their launcher seems to be much more capable than the Red Princess uh, 3 and 4 so we we um we're gonna have to build something a bit bigger so anyway back to this launch because you know um it's going really well we, we didn't actually didn't have any problems with this launch at all and you can see on the top there red bus uh, one style satellite then there's gonna be a lot of them that look like this um either this or double its size and it allows us to basically change the payload for these satellites they're completely unguided so once that top stage detaches, they're left there doing nothing. But it will hopefully allow us to complete a lot of uh, a lot of contracts and, and just keep the, the money rolling. Um, we will probably be looking to uh, to bring in other launch facilities or, or or extra launch pads at least because we could actually roll through quite a lot of of contracts to generate money because particularly this Red Princess uh, 4B, which is this one, the 4B. Uh, with its operated engines and everything it's a much more capable beast and uh, we're, we're looking forward to just seeing what it can do really um, of note the USA are currently preparing to launch their own satellite into orbit in the form of Vanguard 1 um, so, so we're a little concerned that we need to get ahead of the, the, the program here uh, the current Prime Minister of, of the United Kingdom uh, Mr. Harold Macmillan um, has stated that the US uh, must stay first in space. We are the first there and we must lead our way there along with the uh, leading the Commonwealth and of nations. Um, we must uh, we must show the world the glory that is the Commonwealth and, and that the, the Band of Brothers that has created. Um, in reality, I, I think potentially he sees the money aspect and the fact that the, the Americans, you know, haven't really fulfilled a lot of their promises since the Second World War and we need some money. So that's, I think, where that's coming from. But uh, yeah, um, well, hopefully with the launch of this craft, we will open the market for many, many weather satellites. And uh, of course, the nations that are most interested in weather are the British. So that's pretty small sort of market there. But there are other contracts on the way, hopefully. We're going to look at communications and, and, and other things like that, communications and local, location material and things like that. So there's a lot of opportunity for the British in, if we can get out ahead. But again, the concern is that the Russians do seem to have a much more capable launch vehicle than us. They, if they can actually get it to work and they can be can consistent with it, which, you know, the Russians, whatever that thing is, it's a, the pictures are very odd, shall we say. It looks a bit like a Christmas tree. Um, if they can get it to work it could be quite dangerous in, in the fact that it could take over the market but we'll see because the you know the red the red princess has, has shown her herself to be very capable craft nice and easy we're just putting ourselves in the right orbit get ourselves in the right location and we're just going to do the same thing we did last time we're going to burn the rcs and you can see we have got a vast amount of delta v left on this craft because we've operated the engines we've now got spectre engines that are much more efficient well not much more efficient they're still not as efficient as some of the american engines we've heard of but they're they're reasonably efficient 
And so we've actually taken this payload up and we've got quite a lot of uh, Delta V left. So we could have taken a couple of them up, but this re looks very good for any potential contracts that we're gonna have to have. So as we leave that there and we let it just fly around, um, we have just heard that the Russians have sent up a dog. Well, that's not gonna be very sporting, is it? They've put a, a dog in orbit. Um, not happy about that. Are they gonna bring it down? How cruel. Right. Until next time, have a great one. Unless you're a dog, obviously. <laughs>